Speaking to us now is Jason Douglas, the American actor known for his role as Tobin in AMC's The Walking Dead, Beerus in Dragon Ball Super, and has also been in Jack Reacher and Sin City. First things first, Jason, thank you very much for joining us on the line. How are you after your, your weekend in Chicago? Oh, I'm great. It was, uh, I'm, I'm, I was a little tired, but I think I'm recovered now, and uh, it, there were like 40,000 fans there this weekend, so... Tell us what these conventions are like, because, of course, you're coming to Coventry soon for a Comic-Con, obviously relating to The Walking Dead right. primarily. What's the kind of atmosphere like for people who haven't been, perhaps fans of the show, who are thinking about going? Yeah, sure. You know, it's, it's really uh, celebratory. Um, you know, fans get to kind of, in some ways, I think, be a part of the show. You have a lot of folks walking around in, uh, in costume, you know, of their favorite characters. <laughs> They're getting to meet the stars and the celebrities that are in the shows that they love. And then, of course, there are the dealers sections where you can buy all manner of original artwork and swag, of course, like T-shirts and trinkets. But for the most part, it's just kind of, you know, these are festivals that are kind of dedicated to your, your own individual kind of interests. And uh, so I, most fans are, they say they're having the time of their life. So it's fun to be a part of that. And are you looking forward to coming to the UK in Coventry? Absolutely. I, I'm really excited for this, uh, for this one. Uh, it, it is a one-day event in Coventry on the 15th of September. And uh, I'll be there with Dahlia Legault, who is also uh, from The Walking Dead, and several other uh, actors from the UK, and uh, definitely looking forward to it. Fantastic. If you're in the UK, you should definitely pop along to that if you want to meet Jason in person. Now, Jason, I think today uh, we'll talk about The Walking Dead as well as touching on Dragon Ball Super. And I also want to talk a little bit about Breaking Bad, if you don't mind. But on The Walking Dead, yeah, yeah. let's start with Tobin's death firstly. I mean, as you've said in previous interviews, in the comic, Tobin doesn't last very long. He, he seems to be quickly wiped out. Were you pleasantly surprised with how long the writers kept that particular character in the show? Well, I was. You know, I think when we start, we don't really know how much time we have on the show, of course. And I was under no illusions that they were going to make this character into some kind of major player. Although, you know, it's in the back of your mind that you know, obviously the writers for the television show do have liberties to sort of tinker with the uh, with the plot lines. And, you know, they're not entirely beholden to the, to the comic narrative. And so when I wasn't killed off on schedule, you know, uh, toward the middle of season six, I thought, well, maybe there's some life here for this character. And indeed, it seemed to be the case that this uh, was a possibility based on kind of the plot lines around Carol and, and, and Rick and the rest. Season seven, it really dropped off for me. But at the beginning of season eight, it felt like, OK, Tobin's back. You know, he's very active with the group. And, and at this point, it seemed fairly open ended. You know, in the back of my mind, I always knew it's coming for all of us. And, you know, one of the best ways to get the most out of a character death is to kind of raise their stock a bit before that event happens. And so uh, I wasn't terribly surprised when I got the call. And uh, frankly, I was delighted when I read the script because I thought, mm. wow, what a, what a way to go out. It's such, you know, in sort of iconic Walking Dead fashion, it's everything an actor could really want out of a single episode of the show. I mean, I had sort of heroic action, sort of fighting off the saviors, and then there was, you know, what I felt was a, a lovely scene with uh, Melissa McBride, and then, of course, the Night of the Living Dead sort of uh, theme there at the end. So I heard it was kind of Frankenstein-inspired, the walker you were going for. Yeah, it was something that Jeff January, who was the episode director, really had on his mind. He, in particular, is a huge fan of the original Frankenstein film and, of course, of just kind of the, the old-school monster movies. So this was something we discussed quite extensively, was the idea of getting the show back to its roots. Shows like The Walking Dead sort of make us forget sometimes that the zombie genre was really a campy sort of thing to begin with, but it was not without its sort of frights and scares. And so I think he was trying to go for that. And I think we did our best to achieve it. I think, I, I certainly think Walker Tobin has a certain, you know, Frankenstein element to, mm. to his destruction. Were you pleased? I know you mentioned it briefly then, but of course, Tobin does have that brief romance with Carol and, and it could have been something because they haven't spoken for quite a while. Could have been something that the writers brushed under the carpet after a while, but they did rekindle that in the last episode. And were you pleased that they made the effort to go back and, and have that kind of lovely scene with you and Melissa McBride to, to almost finish it off? Sure. You know, I think it was important to revisit that and sort of, you know, put a bow on it, so to speak. I, I think there was 
uh, certainly some, not so much confusion, but just that, you know, there was sort of this wondering out loud, well, you know, what about that? You know, it just sort of ended mm. uh, with her departure. And then, and then we, we never hear it spoken of again. And in fact, I think there were some occasional scenes in which Tobin and Carol sort of appear briefly on screen together, but there's no sort of acknowledgement <laughs> that there was anything between them. So I, I think this sort of neatly puts that episode to rest. And I think also it, it's not perfunctory. I mean, I think it enhances our understanding of both characters a bit. So I think it was very useful within the context of the, the narrative arc of that show. Going back to something you said earlier about Tobin's kind of role in season six, seven and eight, with The Walking Dead, it seems to be one of those shows where there's so many different stories going on now. You've got The Hilltop, you've got Alexandra, you've got what's going on with Simon and whatnot. And it's often broken up in terms of who gets what screen time. Did you find that difficult in terms of there'd be some episodes where, of course, you weren't in at all and, and many other characters weren't in at all. And then there'd be some episodes like the last one where, of course, you are you know on the screen for, for basically the whole episode. Right, I think it's it, it can be difficult to figure out where okay where am I in the story? Mm. Uh, you know, if I've worked one or two episodes and then I'm off for two or three episodes or four, and, and of course the event these last couple of seasons have taken place within a very tight sort of time frame, so it's just a matter of days really that's separating the actual sort of in story events. Yeah. Although you know it's taking us many months to sort of sort things out as audience. But sure, that can be a bit of a challenge, and it can be frustrating as well because, you know, one episode might have extensively involved in the action, and then the next episode you're in, at least for a supporting character like Tobin, you might just see him kind of hanging at the uh, on a guard tower, and mm. then you don't see him again for the rest of the episode. So as an actor, that can be sort of, you know, a bit frustrating because uh, obviously we put in a lot of time and effort into our career, and we don't want to feel like it's sort of stagnating. But at the same time, hanging out has its rewards, you know. So I think, uh, I think ultimately for Tobin, uh, I, I'm glad to where we got to with the character and on the show. It's been wonderful but to be a part of the show and to be a part of the cast. You know, I've, I've learned quite a bit. But I think, I feel like Tobin had his kind of full narrative arc, I think as full as one could have imagined it being. And while I'm thrilled to have been a part of the show, I think I'm glad that I've got an opportunity now to, to explore other things. Definitely. Now, last couple of things on The Walking Dead, Jason. Um, firstly, we, we've mentioned about your acting with Melissa McBride in the show. You, of course, have some pretty intimate scenes together. Were there any other actors who you worked closely with who perhaps you haven't had the chance to speak about in interviews and that you particularly enjoyed working alongside? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, there's the work that you see on screen. Uh, obviously, I've had some you know, work with guys like Andy several times, who, who's not just a good actor, but he's also just a great man. Uh, speaking of Andy Lincoln, and uh, um, he's a family man, and, and the, the, you know, the charitable work that he does, he speaks very passionately about. Uh, that I, I just kind of love hanging out with. He's very inspiring. But, you know, also there's just the friendships that you make on set uh, with various cast and crew. And I think I've mentioned, mentioned elsewhere, I, you know, I've, I've developed friendships with some of these folks like Dahlia and Anne Mahoney, who played Olivia, uh, Kenrick Green, uh, who plays Scott. You know, so in fact, uh, Kenrick and I used to have kind of a running joke when we would work together. We would kind of hang out between scenes and... Uh, we often thought, you know, next season, that's our big season, you know, Scott and Tobin, they're going to get a, <laughs> a, a an on-the-road episode, right? We're going to have to run for some medical supplies or something, and we're going to get caught up with something, some challenge that we have to get out of. And, and, uh, and so that'll establish Scott and Tobin as sort of uh, this, you know, dynamic duo. And, of, of course, it's, it's all very tongue-in-cheek and ironic, but, <laughs> uh, but, but th this is how you pass time on set. And it's how you get to know people. I think you've come up with a good idea for a spin-off show then. We should have Tobin and Scott, what happened in the kind of build-up to the apocalypse. I think that'd be great. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would go for that for sure. We've spoken to a couple of actors, Jason Warner-Smith and Josh Michael, for instance, who've said that although they're very pleased with the roles they got on The Walking Dead, it wasn't the first role that they auditioned for. There are other parts that they went for. You speak very highly of the character of Tobin, but out of interest, did you ever, because it, he comes in quite late, Tobin, of course, I think it's season five or season six he comes in. End of five, yeah. End of five. Were there any characters in the early seasons that you went for? Yeah, I did, actually. I auditioned for the role of Merle, oh, right. uh, which may seem hard to believe, but I can, uh, I can get pretty rough. <laughs> but uh, as it turns out, that role went to the very best possible choice in Nickel Rooker. And, you know, it wasn't the only role I auditioned for. I, I auditioned for Otis, uh, the farmhand, back in, I guess that was season, maybe season two. So, uh, yeah, you know, and, and that's just how it is when you have a, a long-running hit show and you start auditioning. 
they like your work in some regard, they'll tend to continue to bring you in and see what fits. And so uh, as, an act, as actors, sort of the best thing that we can do is just kind of show up and give the best performance that we can. Even if we don't get cast in that role, it can often mean more opportunities down the road, which is how it turned out for me. Lastly, on The Walking Dead, with Tobin, were there any scenes that we perhaps didn't get to see as the audience that Tobin was involved in that you wish kind of made it to air in a particular episode? You know, most of what I did made it in, but there was a bit more of uh, back in season six when Carol and Tobin first connect. There's kind of a sort of longish scene where they're sort of sitting on Tobin's porch, smoking a cigarette, sort of having a conversation. And there was a bit more of that that just for time didn't make it in. It was a bit of Tobin sort of musing on you know, the way time has gotten away from them. And, and it, it was kind of philosophical. And I understand why it was probably cut. It doesn't really advance the plot. But, but I thought it was kind of a lovely. You know, if we were making a film, you certainly would have left it in because it, it's a great character moment. But yeah, I think they had to be a bit more tidy with that episode. Now, Jason, moving on to Dragon Ball Super, of course, that's something you're heavily involved in playing Beerus the Destroyer. Going from one big project to another one like that, you've been involved in in Dragon Ball Super, I know, for quite a while. But the scale of that project, did you quite realize how big the fan base was? No, I think I came in uh, having done, you know, some things for Dragon Ball Z Kai, which was a a release of some of the older Dragon Ball episodes that were redone. And then I had done some work on the Dragon Ball video games. And I think we, even when we did Beerus, I think the first time I recorded that character was for one of the early Dragon Ball video games that came right before the film Battle of Gods, which is where we really meet Beerus for the first time. And there was some hint that this character might be pretty important going forward, but I, I really didn't have a sense of just how much she would be involved, uh, nor did I really grasp... I mean, I've been doing anime since the late 1990s, and so I've done hundreds of characters and hundreds of titles, but I've never done something quite on the scale of Beerus, the Destroyer, in in terms of not just the importance of the show, but the size of the fan base and the reception that they've had to the character. It's really been amazing to me to just kind of see how that's unfolded. And, of course, I meet a lot of those fans when I go to conventions. Uh, You know, they write to me as well, But it's really at the pop culture conventions where the fans are able to kind of come out and kind of express their love for the character and for the show. So that's um, that's really been eye opening for me. It is funny, and you've probably seen on Twitter when a lot of people discover that you, as in Tobin in The Walking Dead, is also Beerus the Destroyer in Dragon Ball Super. Right. They, they can't quite believe it. It's still happening, and <laughs> uh, the first time that anyone really had a clue, because no one did, I mean, really no one did, there was no kind of knowledge of any crossover, and the first time it happened was the first time I had, uh, I guess when that episode with Tobin and Carol uh, back in season six And on The Talking Dead, which is the interview program that airs after every episode, aired that evening. They did a very brief sort of info card, if you will, with uh, a shot from that scene. And it said, you know, a little bio information about me. Because really, no, I, I think amongst the fan base of Walking Dead, you know, there wasn't wide awareness of who is the actor playing this role. And the info on the card said that Jason Douglas is a prolific voice actor. It didn't really reference my other film and television work, but it said that I was a prolific voice actor, having voiced work in, and it listed a couple of titles. Uh, So that was the first time that fans started realizing that I had sort of crossed over into other things. There were fans who were watching Walking Dead, and even now this happens, who are just now finding out, oh, this is the same actor that plays Beerus. I can't believe that. And so then they dive in and they find out about all the other things I've done, you know, Attack on Titan and, and all these other shows. You mentioned then that you've been doing kind of voiceover acting since the 1990s. And I know, so you, of course, you do film and TV, but then separately voiceover for TV and film and then voiceover for gaming. In terms of kind of the difference between, do you view your role as Tobin and your roles in other TV series as separate from your voiceover work? Because it's, of course, a completely different skill that most other actors, I know some do occasionally, someone like Michael Rooker, who we mentioned earlier, I know does participate in that, but not many do. Do you view it as completely separate? I I really view it all as one career with many different avenues of work and income, frankly. I mean, I always have described myself as kind of a blue-collar actor, which is to say that it's not as if I get scripts sent to me and I get to simply approve which projects I'm going to do. I'm still hustling. I'm still reading for things. I'm still getting rejected uh, for, for things. And so uh, 
from the beginning of my career as an actor, I knew that in order to sort of make a living at it, I couldn't just stick to one thing. So early on, I was doing quite a bit of theater. So I would supplement my work on stage by doing voice acting. And that's kind of how I saw my career going. When I was in my early 20s, my entire goal was to be a member, a company member at a reputable regional theater somewhere here in the States. And, and that's all I really knew. So I was doing theater at night. I was doing voice acting whenever I could during the day, as well as what you would consider corporate films or industrial films, mm. uh, you know, training videos, this sort of thing. And that was my career in, the tw in my 20s. And I've always just continued the spirit of that, which is to say, you know, on Thursday, I might be doing a voiceover, but on Friday, I might be getting on a plane to go to Atlanta or, or, or some other part of the country to shoot a film. And then when I get back, you know, I'm going to take the trash out and take <laughs> my kids to school, and then I'm going to head to the studio to do more voice work. So the work itself is, you know, different. Uh, obviously, I think in anime, I get to do a much wider range of characters. There, there are things that I can do, obviously, as a voice actor that I wouldn't get the opportunity to do on camera. But I love the theatricality of it. But at the same time, I, I love film, and I love going to see movies, and I love that manner of storytelling. So I, I can't say that one is better than the other for me. I think I'm a better actor by doing all of it. Do you find one easier than the other out of interest? You know, it's an interesting question, because on camera... I'm more often called to be myself, right? So some, some type of character that is close to who you already are. But that generally does require quite a bit of jumping through hoops, whether it's, you know, from the audition to the travel to getting into hair and makeup to kind of being on set all day, doing take after take in order to get it right. Uh, obviously, working on The Walking Dead is also just physically tiring because you're often working in the, the Georgia heat or it's an all night shoot. So you're not sleeping. On the other hand, if I do a voice like Krieg for a game like Borderlands 2, I can taste blood in my throat when the session is done. Really? Um, you know, there's something to be said about, sure, because, you know, those are, those are the sort of monster voices that are sort of, you know, they get, you <laughs> they, they get down into your throat. On the other hand, of course, voiceover can be quite convenient. I mean, I can go in and do a voiceover. In fact, I've got a session this afternoon that I'm doing for a corporate client, and uh, I'll be doing it from my studio here at home, where I speak to you now. Mm. Uh, you know, I don't have to, uh, I don't have to dress to impress the client. I just have to perform. And most of that work will be done in much the same voice that you're hearing me talk to you right now. So yeah, it, it, I think all things have their sort of pros and cons. I, I enjoy travel a bit, but I, I don't enjoy the hustle bustle of trying to get through the airport and get to the job. But once I'm there, I, I generally enjoy the cities I get to go to and the people that I meet when I get there. So. Out of interest, lastly on that, is there any difference that you have to kind of tweak when you do a game, even if you're playing the same character compared to a TV series? Is, there, is it slightly different voiceover acting for gaming or do you approach it as different? Well, the voice acting for gaming is, is, is interesting because, well, first of all, you're not seeing necessarily the character that you're going to be playing. So sometimes you're sort of flying blind, if you will. You, you're creating a, a character. You might have one sketch that says this is what he's going to look like. Whereas when I do voiceover for uh, anime, I'm sort of tracking to visuals that are already there. I mean, I'm, I'm actually watching the episode. So there is that difference just technically. And then for video games, uh, th there are a lot of kind of responses and utterances and screams uh, that are based on what the player is doing. And so you, you spend a lot of time just either grunting or saying things like, you know, left flank, left flank, left flank. And then so you'll do it that with that intensity and then you'll go right flank, right flank, right flank. And, you, you know, you'll spend, you'll spend a half an hour doing these things. And then, of course, it's the actual player actions that sort of bring those uh, phrases out of your character in the game. So there's less of a narrative arc when you're doing video games, unless there's a well-written cutscene that shows your character sort of interacting with other characters, and that's more narrative. But in most cases, you're creating a voice that's meant to supplement the gameplay. So it is quite a bit different. 
And lastly, Jason, on Breaking Bad, I want to ask you about, because I think you've, of course, been in Walking Dead, which is such a big franchise. Also, Dragon Ball Super as well is such a, a massive franchise. But Breaking Bad as well, and it, was a, it wasn't perhaps as big a role as Tobin, but with that particular right. series, did you realise, again, how big it was at the time, and what was it like working on a series kind of as popular as that has, has turned out to be? I knew that it was a big deal, and I was a fan, so to sort of get to be a part of it, I just felt like it was such an honor to be asked to be a part of it. And of course, the first episode I did was the final episode of season four. Now, if you recall, at least and for me, this was really the final episode of the entire sort of character arc of Walter White. If you think about season five being kind of an um, epilogue, right? But the final episode of season four was called Face Off, and it's the one in which Gus Fring finally gets his due, if you will. So there was even some talk at that time that they weren't sure if the show would be renewed for season five. So I wasn't sure if I would, you know, I I wasn't sure if this is, is this the final episode of this entire series? But I was getting to work with Vince Gilligan, who is the series creator. He also directed that episode. And of course, uh, I got to work with Brian Cranston and and several of the principals uh, on that episode in a kind of a unique interrogation scene. And so, you know, I felt like to get to be a part of uh, such a legendary show at that point in my career, I I just felt like a a clinic. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm watching how not only I'm watching how the director is working, but I'm watching how the actors are are working as well. And it's uh, it's quite revealing. Must be a really cool project to have been a part of. Uh, Jason, before we let you go, I want to ask you uh, a couple of things about some of the upcoming projects you've got coming up. Fans of yours, what's you've got um, everything from kind of Trial by Fire, Droper, Texas Cotton. What are these are you most looking forward to fans to come and see you in? Yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of fans of the of uh, the kind of projects that I've already been a part of will probably be most you know most excited about Dropa, which is a kind of an independent sci-fi film. And I say independent, very independently financed on a limited budget, but but by a a director who is, I think, a real visionary and is very technically gifted. And the film has just a a really beautiful look. Uh, You can find the trailer online. You'll see what I mean. But uh, it's it's a very, I call it sort of Blade Runner meets District 9. It definitely has some very familiar sort of sci-fi themes. But hopefully there's uh, there's enough that's original in there and kind of unique as an independent film that I think fans will find it compelling. And then, and then you mentioned Trial by Fire. This is a very different kind of film starring Laura Dern. It's uh, based on real life uh, story, a kind of an infamous Texas death penalty case from about a decade ago. It's one of those uh, sort of stories that need to be told. And Jason, just before we let you go, where can people kind of keep up with you on social media and follow your work? Yeah, sure, Henry. A great place to start is on Twitter. I'm uh, Mr. Jason Douglas. I also have a Facebook uh, fan page, Jason Douglas Fans, and uh, you can find me bopping around on, on Instagram. Well, Jason Douglas, thank you very much for joining us on the line over in the States. Make sure you go and see Jason when he comes to Coventry very soon for the Comic-Con there. Jason, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Henry. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Hi, this is Jason Douglas. I play Tobin in The Walking Dead, and you're listening to Raw.